Good morning, welcome to the American Enterprise Institute. I'm Mark Thiessen and this morning we are pleased to welcome uh, Mayor Francis Suarez of the city of Miami. Uh, Mayor Suarez won his last election with 86% of the vote. Uh, and unlike a Cuban election, those were actual real voters in a real democratic system. Uh, but it's a overwhelming, by an overwhelming margin, he's united Democrats and Republicans in one of America's largest cities to tackle issues such as crime and taxes. And uh, they, they've spurred economic, an economic resurgence, resurgence across the city. Um, and he was recently named uh, time future, what, a Time Future 100 leader and has been elected to serve as the president of the US Conference of Mayors uh, for the 2022-23 term. Um, as the leader of a truly global city, Miami, with residents from almost every uh, city in our hemisphere and country in our hemisphere, Mayor Suarez is one of the few mayors in America who has not just an urban policy, but a foreign policy. Um, he is the first Miami-born mayor, but his father, Xavier Suarez, was the Miami's first Cuban-born mayor. Um, and his family fled Fidel Castro's Cuba in 1961 to come to Miami. Uh, in Cuba, Mayor Suarez's grandfather was jailed by the Castro regime, as were his grandfather's two brothers, one of whom died in Castro's gulag. So he spends a lot of time uh, thinking about Cuba, thinking about freedom and how to grow freedom and prosperity in our hemisphere. And today he's going to share with us his vision for a hemisphere growing in freedom and opportunity for all. So ladies and gentlemen, uh, we welcome the 33rd mayor of the city of Miami, uh, Francis Suarez. Thank you so much, Mark. And I'm sorry that I couldn't be with you in person. Uh, I can assure you it was uh, certainly for no lack of effort. <laughs> uh, you know, President Doerr, uh, esteemed scholars of the American Enterprise Institute, uh, fellow elected officials, ladies and gentlemen, my fellow Americans. It's a privilege to address you today on an issue that impacts the lives of my residents and the security of all Americans. As the mayor of Miami, I serve an American city that is at once a city of freedom and a city of the future. Some refer to us as the West Berlin of the Western Hemisphere, others as a gateway to the Americas, and even others as a piece of Latin America in America. But today's Miami is truly more than a gateway to the Americas. We are a global American city, as Mark mentioned, a shining city on a hill, serving as the economic, cultural, and political heart of the larger Americas. As some of you have either read or seen over the past few years, we have leveraged common sense policies and digital technology to transform Miami into the next capital of capital. We are also proud Americans, the children and grandchildren of political refugees who love this country, who love what it represents and who love what it is, a confident and strong safe haven that welcomed them from the tyranny of communism. As the first Miami born mayor of Miami, whose parents arrived here as children and have been blessed to be embraced by America as Americans, it holds special meaning. This is why I'm addressing you today as a child of exiles who represent a growing number of, Amer of Americans who see some profound warning signs around our region that do not bode well for any nation, no less one as fortunate as ours. Over the past few months and across our country, we have heard the resounding cries for freedom from the Cuban people through protests by Cubans of all possible backgrounds. Their cry is poignant and powerful, simply libertad. But it's important to understand the broader context of these events. Aside from our geographical closeness, America has a special relationship with Cuba and her people. We offered refuge to Cuban patriots when they fought for independence against Spain. We stood with them as allies in winning Cuban independence at the Battle of San Juan Hill. We have a shared history of sacrifice and support for the advance of freedom in the Americas. The people of Cuba are more than just our neighbors. In a real historical sense, they are extended family. On July 11th, the world witnessed a widespread up uprising by the Cuban people against the Cuban regime. Contrary to the claims of this administration, it was not the result of lack of COVID supplies or the embargo, but it was a result of a regime that has systematically lied, starved, and oppressed its population. This is a regime that conducts human trafficking of its doctors while its own people are exposed to a vicious pandemic. This is the regime that has embezzled all areas of its economy and enriched itself internationally while depriving its own people of basic goods on the global market. 
And this is a regime that peddles a long established lie that lifting the embargo will liberate the Cuban people while at the same time trafficking in its people, training left-wing paramilitaries in Venezuela and Nicaragua and throughout the hemisphere, assisting global drug cartels and profiting from existing international trade through state-owned shadow corporations. What the Cuban people demanded on July 11th is the same that they are demanding now, freedom from communism, repression, misery, and despair. Their cries echo the same cries made by Hungarians in 1956, Czechs in 1968, Poles in 1983, and East Germans in 1989. It is a cry to the world and to America. It is a cry that cannot be silenced and cannot be pacified. It is not the end, and, and this is not the end. The Cuban people will continue to demand freedom despite the beatings, bullets, and the brutality that the communist regime now imposes on them under an internet sh shutdown. And when we step back and zoom out, we see a larger trend across the Americas. We see patterns of communist resurgence, a campaign of lies from discrediting the free market to dismantling free speech. And we all know that Cuba has long been the head of the snake, the proxy by which countries like Russia and China spread the cancer of communism throughout the region, throughout our own backyard. Nicaragua has been battling this disease for 40 years, creating a massive exodus that my city, more than anywhere else, has had to handle. Venezuela, once one of the richest economies in the world, in only 20 years became a failed state with more than 5.4 million people that had to abandon their country. Communist regimes in Latin America finance themselves through drug cartels, infesting the region with violence, death, and decaying democratic institutions. Mexico, Brazil, Colombia, and Argentina are also at risk, and the United States is doing virtually nothing. It is not our role to be the policemen of the world, but it is our role to be the leaders of the free world and to deny Russia and China to benefit from these regimes. We know that the only equality communism and socialism bring is the equality of poverty, equality of oppression, and equality of despair. It is a system built on a fraud, a lie, where every person is relegated into an oppressed group and then pit against one another. It pits rich against poor, white against black, men against women, the old against the young, all in the service of a perverse form of utopia, and they call it progress. This political formula manipulated the masses in Cuba, in Nicaragua under the Sandinistas, and in Venezuela under Chavez and Maduro. And if we're not careful, it will be used to divide our own society and to undercut the pillars of our republic. And there are those, even in our own country, who erroneously blame American imperialism and the expansion of free markets. Nothing could be further from the truth. In fact, free markets, free elections, and free governments unleash the creative and productive energies and opportunities for any person who lives under them. And there is no greater proof of this than the explosive growth, progress, and opportunity found in the city of Miami. For me, the moment of truth came during the visit of Homeland Security Secretary Mayorkas to Miami. The event was billed as a listening tour, but it only regurgitated well-known fallacies about the communist regime in Cuba with scripted statements of the Biden administration's so-called success. It was billed as a bipartisan, as bipartisan, but aside from me, it did not represent our elected leadership from both parties. It was billed as inclusive, but it failed to include many of the most credible, knowledgeable, and well-known Cuban human rights leaders and activists. Simply put, it was a partisan media event with scripted statements, one-sided representations, and a recitation of administration talking points. And so to quote Winston Churchill, I was not the lion, but it fell to me to give the lion's roar. Now I must speak for millions of Americans who see America failing to lead like America. We must either deal with this movement now on our terms, or we will have to deal with it later on their terms. We must confront this communist regime and its proxies with the moral clarity and the political leadership characteristic of our country, our history, and our values. In Miami, we know that when American leadership is absent in the Americas, it invites the influence and intervention of outside powers whose own ideology and interests run counter to the very values, history, and freedoms of the people of the Americas. 
The people of the Americas need our help and need our leadership. Advancing the future of freedom in the Americas cannot be a partisan issue nor an isolated one. Everything is connected from the Tierra del Fuego to Fairbanks, Alaska. Fairbanks, Alaska. This is a larger question of American leadership in the Americas. Our president, our country needs to decide who we are and what we are about. We need to decide if we will lead or if we will recede. Decline is a choice and leadership is a burden, but the choice is inescapable. And every president rises and falls by answering or failing to answer this call for leadership. Will we retreat within ourselves or will we stand with our neighbors? Will we replace the old colonialism of Europe with the new colonialism of Russia or China? Will we advance the spread and strength of freely elected governments and human rights? Or will we allow tyranny and despotism to reassert itself in the Americas? We must respond with a bold act of leadership that advances freedom and ensures stability in the Western Hemisphere. We must use the tools at our disposal. Diplomacy. We have currently failed to rally the OAS and international community to support the Cuban people in their quest for liberty. The prior administration succeeded in creating a coalition of several dozen countries who recognized the legitimacy of the Juan Guaido government in Venezuela. Non-military intervention. Again, here the administration has not made any tangible or verifiable progress. From failing to administer any significant humanitarian aid to being able to reestablish internet access. Military intervention. Everyone wants to see transitions from brutal dictatorships to democracies happen peacefully. And we know that in the history of humanity, it has happened. We should all strive and work arduously for peace, and we should pray for peace. I know I do, every day. I pray the St. Francis prayer. Lord, make me an instrument of your peace. But for the most powerful country on the planet to simply take the option of military intervention completely off the table, weakens our position globally and emboldens our enemies across the world. Afghanistan provides ample evidence of this. My challenge to all of you is the same one President Reagan posed 40 years ago, to design and to implement a forward strategy of freedom that reflects our national values and advances our strategic interests and uses our technology, civil society, free markets, and all of our capabilities to aid opposition to these, to these communist regimes while providing a path towards sustainable democracies. I also ask free market think tanks like the American Enterprise Institute and the Heritage Foundation along with congressional leaders to design a package of policies that counteracts this movement in the Western hemisphere and offers an alternative model, the Miami model, so to speak, that expands free markets and invests in one in the one essential pillars of democracies, a vibrant and growing middle class. Also, I call upon the thinkers of this community to put, continue to please uh, consider a Helms-Burton 2.0 in whatever form that looks like, using our superior technology to continue to create uh, viable alternatives to communism throughout the region. The call to action is clear and the time for action is now. We Americans need to act like Americans. We must be the America we know and the America we need. We must stand with freedom now and take a stand at this very moment. Thank you. Well, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, that was a rousing call for American leadership, and we we at AI appreciate that. Um, before we get into the uh, to the uh, specifics of policy, I wanted to ask you a little bit because people are getting to know you a little bit about your origin story. Your family uh, fl fled here from Castro's Cuba. Your gr your grandfather and and granduncles were were in Castro's prisons, uh, and your family made it here to America. And you've now you're now the second generation of of leadership in the in the mayor's office in Miami. Tell us a little bit about your family, uh, your background, and the lessons that you learned from your father and grandfather. You know, my, my grandfather was part of, of a coalition of organizations that tried to overthrow the Batista uh, dictatorship. Uh, and at the time, it was unclear that Castro would emerge as a leader of, of that movement. And so my, my grandfather was part of the Christian Democratic Movement. Um, him and his brothers uh, uh, were part of that movement. Uh, unfortunately, once once Castro seized power, and it was clear that he was, uh, you know, he was trying to create a, a Marxist, uh, you know, regime. Um, he immediately jailed anyone that could oppose that transition. So my grandfather and his two brothers were jailed. 
Um, my grandfather was the father of a family of 14. My dad was the ninth of 14. Um, and they came to this country with nothing. Uh, my father uh, and, and his brothers and sisters were blessed to be given scholarships to some of the, the most prominent schools in the country, uh, which I think is another example of how great this country is. Um, they went to private schools. Um, and, and my father got a full scholarship to Villanova University in Philadelphia, where he studied mechanical engineering and got two graduate degrees from Harvard, um, a, a master's in public policy and, and a, a Juris Doctor uh, in a four-year uh, program So at the Kennedy School. So you know, we, we're the quintessential, uh, you know, refugee uh, story in America where you come to this country with nothing. And in one generation, um, in the case of my father, was able to be the first Cuban mayor of a major city in the history of the United States. And so that is the legacy that I've inherited um, as, as a, a lifelong Miamian. And uh, it's an interesting inflection point for our city because we have a 125 year history, but had never elected a Miami born, uh, Miami produced uh product to lead the city. And so this is a great moment where we're transitioning to another generation of leadership and another another generation of, of, of what Miami is and will become. That's a, that's a great story. And by the way, just for our, our viewers, if you'd like to submit a question, uh, you can submit them to Jackson Crace. Uh, the email address is Jackson dot K-R-A-S-E at AEI dot org. Or you can uh, put them on Twitter with the hashtag uh, AEI lat am l a t a m um so sticking on that uh point you know you're you're, you're you have your you're the quintessential american uh, immigrant story uh the uh, the american dream uh miami is filled with people like you from all over the hemisphere and from all over the world quite frankly um it's a city of immigrants a city of people who are refugees fleeing oppression who came here we now have, um, with the fall of Afghanistan and the, ta and the fall, uh, to the Taliban, we now have hundreds of thousands of Afghan refugees uh, coming here to the United States seeking the, those, those kinds of opportunities. Polls show that the vast majority of Americans support uh, welcoming Afghan refugees, but there are some people on the right who say, you know, uh, the one prominent uh, uh, person on the right who's in, sort of on the anti-immigrant side said, do you, want your, do you want your city to turn into a stand? Um, you know, that uh, w w how should we how should the Republican Party view Afghan refugees? Well, I think, first of all, we have to understand that we are a country of immigrants. Uh, certainly uh, immigration in the context of the city of Miami has been a tremendous blessing. Right. And we're a, a city that, as we've talked about with some of the sub Hispanic populations like Venezuelans, Nicaraguans and others uh, who are free, fleeing communist persecution, uh, who come to this country. And I would say in, in the extremely vast majority, if not unanimity, come and are hardworking. Um, they want to be Americans. Uh, they love and appreciate this country and appreciate what this country is about. And that's how, really how this country became great. And so I think that's something we have to be conscientious of. In the case of Afghanistan, you have an additional component, which is that many of, of the refugees uh, were aiding the United States in Afghanistan uh, actively. And so what message do we send if we don't take care of those people who risk their lives trying to save Americans in a foreign country. Uh, I think that that's a sort of a secondary uh, uh, consideration, but a very important one because the world is watching. Every time uh, you know the United States acts in, in whether it's an advancement or retreat of the values that we discussed, the world is watching and it's recalibrating and making decisions based on uh, you know what American leadership means. And that's why I said in the speech that we have to define who we are at this given moment. I think that you know one of the things that the president has failed to do is define who America is uh, under his leadership. And that's something that every president has to do or fails to do and is frankly defined uh, by that decision. How, uh, so you're, you're, the Cuban regime is probably one of the world's, mo world's most enduring totalitarian dictatorships. Uh, we, I mean, we're now in the uh, six, uh, heading into seven decades of, of, of the embargo. Um, but for the first time, I think it's it's facing an unprecedented confluence of events that could that could topple it. Uh, you've got the worst economic crisis in decades. Um, and in the past, when they had economic crisis, first the Soviet Union would bail them out, but then the Soviet Union collapsed. Then they turned to Venezuela, but Venezuela is falling apart, so they're losing that. So they, they really don't have anybody to bail them out 
uh, like, uh, like they did in the past. And second of all, because of social media, uh, Cubans seem to be more aware of, uh, have more information, the, the information blockade uh, that the regime puts on its own people has, has broken. Uh, they've got, they, they have the arrival of social media, 3G phone service. Um, so millions have internet access and they have signal and telegram and these other ways to communicate. Um, how, how do we seize this moment of opportunity uh, and especially in the face of a lot of people who said you've been trying to bring them down for seven decades, and you know it's never going to happen. Uh, why is this moment different? Well, this moment's different, Mark, because uh, you know many of us were living in that post 1960 world, right, where uh, you know Cubans were exiled in, in sort of the, the the exiled diaspora of Miami, and we're sort of fighting this fight from afar. Uh, I think this moment is completely different because the the people who rose up on July 11th were Cubans born and indoctrinated in the communist ideology that are now, you know, were probably kids uh, of a lot of the people that stayed in the 1960s and 1970s and have now come to their own conclusion that there is nothing that the Cuban government can tell them uh, that can convince them that this is not a completely failed system of government, a completely failed economic system. Um, they can't use the embargo anymore as an excuse. They can't use American, the, the big bad American imperialist uh, as an excuse. They just don't have, you know, the, the fraud has been exposed. Um, you know, it's one thing to go through one generation uh, who believed in the, in some of these uh, absurd concepts that have never worked out in the history of humanity. It's a whole other thing when you try to get a second generation of people who were born um, and, and who can make up their own conclusions. And they realize and they know that a lot of their friends and family members are going to the United States. And they, they see, as you said, through social media and other, um, you know, and other devices, they see what's available to them uh, if they go to a free country. And so I think that is, that's a significant uh, a difference in, in what is happening now versus what has happened in 1980, in the 1980s and, and, and before then. And, you know, my only concern is that this is not the United States, right? It, it's not like you can go out and get an AR-15 uh, in Cuba and, and defend yourself, right? Or, or, or this is not, you know, the American Civil War where both sides had relatively equal uh, armament. Uh, you know, this is this is a, a situation where you have governments just like in Venezuela that have superior military grade equipment and the population doesn't really have a means of defending itself. So the question is, how does a peaceful transition occur? And, and there's only a limited number of ways that that can happen either through some sort of military uh, coup internal uh, where the military itself decides that they have had enough and that the people are starving and that, the, you know, the people could turn on them. Um, uh, you know, or, or through some other uh, a peaceful transition, you know, a la, uh, you know, Gorbachev or someone who comes to power and realizes, hey, look, this is just not working and uh, this we have to do the right thing. So the concern that I have is, is, is now we're at this point and what does the United States do, not just for Cuba, but for Venezuela and, and Colombia and to stem this tide of communism to prevent it from continuing to grow and infiltrate our hemisphere. And we have to be very clear about what we're willing to do and not willing to do. And I told this to Secretary Mayorkas, I said, look, you know, the Cuban people deserve to know clearly what the United States is willing and capable of doing, you know, without divulging anything that's strategic uh, and what they're not willing to do. And, 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 you know, whether or not the Cuban people have to sort of understand that they're on their own. And right now it really feels like they're on their own, um, that, 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 you know, America, as what happened in Afghanistan, is, is completely receding um, and, and is not, um, you know, involving itself at a very, very high level, which is why no one, unfortunately, a lot of people are not talking about Cuba anymore. Uh, which is what I predicted would happen. Yeah. Well, so speaking of that, so you're one of the only public figures who came out in support of the Biden administration potentially taking military action uh, in in Cuba. Uh, you cited the uh, Clinton administration's use of force in Kosovo, George H. W. Bush administration's uh, in intervention in Panama that uh, overthrew the Noriega dictatorship and restored democracy there. Um, w there obviously is a history of this. What? We do, as you just mentioned, we just withdrew that from Afghanistan after 20, after 20 years. Do you think there's an appetite for military intervention in our hemisphere? And why is this something that should be considered? I don't think there's an appetite for military intervention ever. <laughs> I, yeah. I think we live in a world where there's never an appetite uh, for mili military intervention. I think military intervention is a last resort and is something that you do in circumstances where there aren't alternatives. Uh, you mentioned uh, two examples. The other example that I cited was you know, Obama, um, you know, making a very 
courageous decision, frankly, to send in Navy SEALs into a, a foreign country violating their sovereignty, a, a nuclear power, Pakistan, uh, to take out, uh, you know, uh, Osama bin Laden. You know, that was not, uh, uh, you know, that was a very, very tough decision, I'm sure, and one that was fraught with uh, potential uh, consequences. Uh, you know, in life and in sports, we always look back and when, uh, when we see a play, oh, why did he take that shot? And then it goes in, you're like, oh, this is great. You know what I mean? And then, and, and, and when it doesn't work, you're like, oh, this is terrible. Uh, mm -hmm. But leadership is about having the courage to take that shot. Uh, you know, I, I think, you know, Americans always back a president who is a leader, who says, hey, you know, this is not what I want to do, but this is what I have to do. And what we saw happen in Afghanistan is you're trying to extract 2,500 uh, soldiers, but because of the debacle that it has become, you have to send in 5,000 soldiers. So you have to actually send in twice the number of soldiers, um, you know, to, to deal with uh, the situation. Yeah. And we may have to send them back at some point if that becomes an allocated yeah. safe haven. So you're absolutely right there. So let's, let's short of military action. What, what could the Biden administration do uh, to support the Cuban people? You urge President Biden to come to Miami and deliver, deliver a Reagan-esque uh, Berlin Wall speech and said you would support him. Um, you would you would back him. You would reach across the aisle and, and support him if he did that. And he chose not to do that, um, which is unfortunate. Uh, but what what could uh, what could a Biden administration do uh, to increase the pressure and help the uh, the dissident community in Cuba? Well, like you said, you know, I, I think the very minimum that he could have done was to come to Miami and, and give a tear down that wall speech. I think, uh, as we know, um, the, the attention span of the world is, is, is as small as it's ever been, right? With 24 hour news stations, uh, today's news is forgotten tomorrow. And the only way, the reason why Miami has been successful, for example, is because we've kept the volume level up on this sustained uh, story of how Miami is becoming an innovation capital of the world. That was very intentional. Um, that took a lot of work and a lot of energy uh, and a co constant storytelling. I have these cafecito tech talks which are um, you know podcasts that I've done 150 of in 90 uh, in nine months. So to, to maintain a, a story in, in a modern day world, it takes work, and so it's a it's a function of priority. You know, is it a priority for this administration to to eradicate communism in this hemisphere? Is it a priority of this administration? Uh, you know, to be to have a, a strong America that that is uh, you know uh, that is defending its values throughout the world. And I, I haven't seen that out of this administration. It's not that I want to be critical. On the contrary, like I said, I, I would be happy to applaud the president. And I have done so in a, in, in a variety of his foreign policy initiatives. I'm sorry, and his domestic policy initiatives. I have absolutely no problem supporting his domestic policy initiatives. I supported uh, the American Rescue Plan. Uh, I went to the White House uh, as a bipartisan uh, coalition of mayors and governors. Uh, and the city of Miami has benefited greatly from that. We're now going to uh, put forth a, 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 what I call a functional zero plan to eliminate homelessness in the city of Miami. So I've, I have been willing to applaud the president when the president does something that I think is courageous, smart, and, and, and beneficial to this country. At the same time, I have to be honest, and when I, I think the president is missing out on opportunities, and by the way, I told this directly to the Secretary of Homeland Defense, who happens to be Cuban-American as well and understands these issues, I think, very intimately. Um, you know, I said, look, this is, a, this is an opportunity. You have to look at this as an opportunity for the president to come to, to Miami and, and, and elevate this issue to one of the main issues in his agenda. I think he had done some things to his credit that were counter to the Obama policy, uh, frankly, uh, in some of his pronouncements and some of his public pronouncements. He was very strong in, in, in speaking against socialism and communism in one interview that I saw. Uh, and I think he's tried to um, do some of the things that, that the dissident community uh, uh, has asked for. Uh, but but th th it's been long, uh, like a lot of things have been long on promises, short on accomplishments. And I think, uh, you know, the United States, again, needs to define itself. It needs to, uh, you know, and, and, and I think what worries me is when you're China, uh, what are you telling Taiwan? Uh, 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 we've lost your feed, uh, Mayor. Yeah, I think we lost you there for a second. It's Taiwan. Oh, there you You're back. You're back. Yeah. You said it's you Taiwan. mentioned Taiwan. Yeah. Is Taiwan feeling more confident or less confident about, about their situation given what America has been doing across the globe? 
Yeah, absolutely. You mentioned uh, the need for a Helms Burton 2.0, and that's music to my ears because I worked for Senator Jesse Helms on the Foreign Relations Committee uh, when we passed Helms, Bur Helms Burton, and the ranking member who voted for the bill was uh, Joe Biden uh, at the time. So uh, there's, there's there's a history there. But you know, the the purpose of Helms Burton, one of it, in addition to codifying the embargo, was to crack down on these uh, European and other country uh, companies that were trafficking in stolen uh, American properties in, in, in Cuba um, and tra as because the regime was basically doing a fire sale on these to try and get currency, hard currency, because they had lost their Soviet subsidies. In the years since then, they're, they found new ways to get hard currency. They're, using, they're, they're going outside the financial systems. They're using cryptocurrencies, uh, other ways. What, what, how should we respond to that? And what would a Helms-Burton 2.0 look like in your view? Well, that's why AI exists, right? To give us uh, all of the answers. Uh, no, but I, look, I think we, we need to rely on, uh, you know, on, on the superiority of the United States in terms of technology and our ability uh, to, to track money flows uh, that, that we maybe didn't have in, in, in the past and, and sort of uh, make it a modern day thing. But you, you said something that, that um, was really important, which you said that the ranking member who voted for Helms Burton 1.0, right? Was yeah. Joe Biden, the president of the United States. And I think, you know, if, you, if you, you hear my speech, what I'm saying is this should not have been and has not been uh, historically a hyper-partisan issue, right? The idea of the United States, uh, you know, uh, doing everything in its power, you know, short of maybe some dr dramatic interventions uh, to stop the spread of communism and, and to have speak with moral clarity on this issue has not been a partisan issue. And so, uh, you know, I think, I think 2.0, uh, would be an effort and attempt to ensure that Cubans can communicate with each other, with the rest of the world, maybe be using cryptocurrencies in a different way. In other words, empowering the Cuban people directly with cryptocurrencies and allowing them uh, to bypass the Cuban government. Uh, because one of the one of the great things about uh, cryptocurrencies is they're not controlled by a central bank. Uh, and so uh, they should be uh, accessible through technology. There should be a way uh, uh, to empower Cubans directly. I mean, there's a big debate about remittances and, and how, uh, you know, the Cuban government uh, basically, first of all, takes a percentage of all the remittances. And then uh, to the extent that they allow them to get in, they convert them into pesos and take dollars. So that's another way that they get hard currency. Um, so, uh, you, you know, we, we have to find a way to get around that. And then I think uh, we just haven't done a lot on the coalition building side. Uh, I, think, I think the prior administration, to their credit, um, created a vast coalition recognizing the Guaido government. Um, they, they did very well uh, with the OAS uh, under the, the secretary of, of uh, Carlos Trujillo, who's a Cuban-American from Miami, who did a phenomenal job. Um, we, we just lost a, a big vote uh, recently in the OAS uh, on Cuba. Um, and, and, and so it seems like the tide has turned away from the United States. And we're not, we're not using any of our leverage and our relationships uh, to make sure that the international community is with us. I'll, I'll repeat just for anyone who wants to submit a question, uh, send your question to Jackson Crase, K, Jackson dot K R A S E at AEI.org or on Twitter at hashtag AEI LATAM, A E I L A T A M. Um, so the Cuban regime blames all of its problems on the embargo, right? Um, well, if the embargo is to blame, then what's the excuse in Venezuela? <laughs> Which yeah. is a cause socialist basket case. There's no, there's no embargo at all. Um, I mean, isn't the common factor in both those countries socialism? Absolutely. And, and, and I think, you know, I think I, I heard Senator Rubio talking about the embargo and the embargo is very limited uh, to certain uh, kinds of transactions, uh, but it allows for a variety of things to get through. And then, of course, the, the country can trade with the rest of the world. Right. So it's not like, you know, and I think I think, you know, for the United States, it was important for us to do what we could do. By the way, it's no different than when we applaud uh, the administration, whether it's the Biden or the Trump administration, for sanctioning some of the bad actors uh, in these governments. Uh, I, I think I think at the end of the day, what's frustrating uh, for someone like myself as mayor and as a, uh, you know, the son of Cuban exiles is just, you know, it, it's you, you run up against some of these challenges or these logical challenges, which is, you know, I, I, what, you know, what's the right level of intervention, if any. Um, and, and I think sometimes we just don't speak clearly about these issues or we don't have real debates about them. And even the issue of, of, of military intervention, which, which was very controversial when I said it, you know, the, the, you know, the, the, there isn't any thought about, well, you know, what, what if the battles, A, or B, 
you know, what about the fact that, you know, Cuban generals who right now are maybe considering what to do, you know, are, are not in any sort of fear of any sort of reprisals for the actions that they take. So there is absolutely nothing that we're doing from a military perspective that says, hey, guys, we're watching you and we're willing to take action if you, uh, you know, commit a mass genocide, for example. Um, so I, I think we just don't use our, our military effectively and we're not using our military in the, di the, the diplomatic sense effectively either. One of the things that Cuba and Venezuela have in common is that they have socialism for the masses, uh, but for the leaders, uh, it's a very different system. They, they're all engaged, particularly in Venezuela, but also in Cuba, in narco-capitalism. They're, they're very supportive of capitalism when it comes to uh, the selling drugs uh, and uh, as a source of hard currency. Can you talk a little bit about the problem of narco-capitalism in these socialist uh, regimes? Yeah, and, and narco capitalism is important because it, it uh, sort of enshrines an olig you know an oligarchy, right? Which is really what these countries are about. They're, they're about the leader of the country living like a billionaire, and then you know the, the person's uh, necessary inner circle uh, that allows that person to, to maintain power also has to live like billionaires because otherwise you know you can't buy their loyalty any other way. Um, and of course, anytime that anyone even remotely acts this low, they just you know, they just assassinate the person, uh, you know, without a trial. So that is the way, that is sort of the model of how these governments can survive uh, depriving their entire country of anything good. Um, and, and, they, and they also, as we saw on July 11th, have very, very extensive reprisal networks that allow them to squash uh, any sort of dissident uh, or dissent, uh, and of course, uh, shut down even the means of communication. So, I, I mean, this is somewhat sophisticated in a sense, and in other senses, it's just brutal and unsophisticated means of, of, of control. And I think, you know, again, what concerns me is how do we break through that? Um, will there be, you know, will, will we just get to a point where there's so much starvation, there's so much uh, abject poverty that even the leaders themselves recognize it? And, of course, that's, that's the preferred uh, way that, that, this, uh, that, this, that this transition happens. And we all know that if Cuba um, is, is, is liberated, so goes Venezuela and Nicaragua, and we all feel the same way of Venezuela. In other words, that all these countries are connected through this, this uh, failed experiment. And, 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 and you know, we also talk about you know, what's happening in Argentina, what's happening in Brazil, what's happening in you know, other parts of in Mexico and other parts of, of Central and South America that could continue this disturbing trend in a way that more and more people are enslaved. By the way, that just creates more and more burden on the United States as well. Because A, a lot of those people decide that they wanna flee um, and come to, to this country, um, which creates all kinds of burdens on our immigration system. It creates all kinds of burdens on our social social welfare system. Um, and, and, and frankly, uh, creates conflicts throughout the world. So we have to pay for all this stuff one way or the other. Yep. Uh, today, up to 75% of the Cuban population has some Afro-Cuban ancestry, right? Um, but when the protests, uh, the, uh, the protests started, Black Lives Matter came out in, in favor of the Castro regime. In fact, uh, it seems Cuba is the only country where uh, when police officers beat uh, Afro African-American or Afro-Cuban Afro people, uh, uh, Black Lives Matter sides with, side with the police. Uh, but the regime and its apologists like Black Lives Matter, they, they argue that the, that the Castro regime has advanced racial equality. Um, is that true? What is the state of racial equality in Cuba? And also, what does it say about the left in America that, uh, the, and socialism, the false hope of socialism that so many on the left seem to, to find this totalitarian regime so attractive? Well, first of all, the only equality, like I said in my speech, that uh, communism has successfully implemented is an equality of misery. Right. I mean, they, they've, they've perfected that. Uh, they're very, very good at creating a quality of misery. Uh, you know, anyone who's not in the upper echelon is equally miserable, equally hopeless. Uh, and, and, and what's interesting is that, you know, left um, ideologies uh, and, 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 you know, left leaning, leaning people can't see historically what a failure communism and socialism have been. Right. And, and you see it across American cities. I mean, I was looking at some statistics where if the Biden tax plan goes into effect uh, in New York, you're gonna, you know, people are going to be paying an effective tax rate of over 60%. I mean, that is, uh, there's not much left, <laughs> 39% left. Uh, uh, so I, I suspect that's going to help Miami tremendously. 
but but what 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 uh, what happens is you know in Black Lives Matter, as we all know, um, I mean I don't think it's disputed that their organization was created uh, by Marxists, uh, by people who were Marxist trained, and um, and again it it, it it highlights the hypocrisy, right? Because as you said, uh, in Cuba, most of the people that are protesting, most of the singers that are, are, are producing the songs that are, you know, Patria y Vida, that are Afro-Cuban. Um, and, and so, you know, I, I, I see there's a huge inconsistency there, and I think it's been exposed. So after the fall of the Soviet Union, there was a hope uh, that freedom and democracy would spread across the hemisphere, and it did for a little while. But instead, it looks like the opposite is happening. Both there's 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 socialist backsliding in in Nicaragua and and in Venezuela and and all the rest, but also uh, the socialist ideology that crippled Cuba and Venezuela is spreading here at home. Uh, there's a uh, the Democrats in Washington are pushing a 3.5 trillion dollars in in spending that literally uh, you know all the analysis shows would touch almost every American citizen from cradle to grave in some way. Um, the the polls show that. 51% of Gen Z adults have a positive view of socialism and 54% have a negative view of capitalism. Uh, wh what's going on here? How, how, is, how is socialism uh, you know, having a resurgence here, both in the hemisphere and here in the uh, United States? Well, I mean, it's pretty, it's pretty clear why. I mean, socialism is a great concept, right? It's very attractive. It's this concept that, hey, we'll just take from the rich, who are the ones that are to blame for your problems, and we will spread it equally among everybody. And, and, and that's very attractive. It's, it, what, what I call it is, is one of the largest or one of the most uh, comprehensive frauds perpetuated on humanity. But it is a, but it is a very attractive fraud, right? And so, uh, you know, the, 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 the Democrats still believe that government is a solution to social, so societal problems. And as a person in government, I can tell you that government has very limited competencies. We can do some things well. Uh, you know, mostly, you know, keep our citizens safe, uh, you know, be there to give uh, first responder services when you call 911, uh, pick up your garbage, uh, and, and a few other things in terms of local governments and in terms of the federal government, it should be national defense, uh, you know, obviously our, our infrastructure uh, and, and some of the, uh, the, you know, the social safety nets that we have, like Medicare and, and Social Security. Those are the things that we do well. Uh, I, I think the problem is that that liberals believe that through government, you can re-engineer society. Uh, and that just has never worked. It's just never worked. And I, I don't understand why they can't understand that. And so, you know, it reminds me of another Winston Churchill quote, which is, you know, democracy is the worst form of government except for all the rest, right? Or except for all the others. And I think, you know, maybe, maybe, the, maybe capitalism is imperfect, but it's the best imperfect economic model and economic system. And I think when we see things like Miami coin, which is a fascinating uh, uh, new protocol, which uh, delivers 30% of the proceeds from mining a, a Miami coin trans uh, transaction directly to governments. It's, it's not an involuntary tax system. It's not a you know, philanthropy that is somewhat completely voluntary and at the whim of a philanthropist. This is a third model. When we see something like that happening in a new generation, it could create a different paradigm for how we fund our governments uh, and how we make a more perfect nation and a more perfect city. So let's talk about a country we haven't touched on, which is Haiti. You recently uh, wrote a letter uh, with a bipartisan group of mayors to President Biden talking both about Cuba and about Haiti. And when it comes to Haiti, you said in, in Haiti, we've seen an elected president murdered, leaving his country without an elected government or a stable line of succession. An invitation to chaos, continued injustice and tyranny of civil war only made worse by the recent succession of natural disasters. What what should the United States be doing when it comes to Haiti? Haiti is a very difficult uh, situation. When you talk to people in the Haitian diaspora, there is a re recognition that they need help. And yet there is a, um, a desire not to have too much U.S. intervention uh, in, in Haiti, right? There's this sort of, uh, we want your help, but we don't want you to influence us, right? And so it's, it's, it's a very, very difficult situation. Plus, Haiti doesn't have a lot of the natural resources that other countries had, nor has it been stable. Um, so I think it's it's a very difficult situation. I think, number one, they do deserve TPS status uh, here in the United States, um, without a doubt. Uh, I think, number two, uh, you know, we, um, you know, we have to elevate the issue, right? Uh, this is our hemisphere. And we've got to find ways, because I, I was talking to somebody, you know, in this question of military intervention, I was talking to someone from the military who says, look, we're very good at winning conflicts. What we're not very good at is the post-conflict, you know, transition, 
right? And I think we need to get better at some of this stuff. Not that we want to be nation builders or the world's policemen, but we do have to do a better job of helping people with our resources, um, you know, find ways to be able to govern themselves. And, and, and it's something that's worked exceptionally well in our country uh, for several hundred years. Um, we're flawed like everybody else. Uh, and, and, you know, we have our shiny moments and our not so great moments, uh, particularly if you look at social media. Um, but, uh, you know, we, we're still, uh, you know, sort of the last best hope for, for our world. And so I think uh, we have to find ways to, to help, uh, you know, countries uh, rebuild themselves. And obviously Afghanistan was, was an example of, 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 of a complete failure in that regard. You, you mentioned TPS for Haitians. There's there's tens of thousands of Haitians right now under a bridge in in, uh, in Texas. Uh, the Biden administration has actually started uh, deporting some of those people back to back to uh, to Haiti. What what should they be doing uh, with those folks? Well, I mean, I, I think you have to take a step back and have the broader conversation of immigration in our country. And I firmly believe, at least uh, pre pandemic, we were at hyper full employment. I mean, I think we're, you know, the numbers that I saw, 3.4%, I mean, it's just, it's, it's, it's barely above cyclical unemployment. Um, you know, and most of the people, I call it high performance employment because I think many people had two or three jobs that were not reported, right? I mean, how many people do you know that are, that work in a job and then were an Uber driver, right? And so uh, I, I think we have to really look at this issue in a different way. That's nonpartisan. Obviously, the, the sort of liberal talking point is everybody get, should get in. The Republican talking point is nobody should get in. And I think the the the, the right uh, way to talk about this is to right size our le legal immigration system, right? And and to think about people like like uh, Haitians who are fleeing, uh, you know, abject poverty, chaos. And the and, and and again, here in Miami is a great example. They are incredibly hardworking, uh, peaceful uh, Americans who want to do good. And so if you start from that proposition, not demonizing immigrants, but, but understanding their value, um, we should be upping our legal immigration system probably by 200% uh, at a minimum. Um, and then, of course, we have a variety of undocumented in our country that we all acknowledge, um, you know, are, are, we're not going to be able to kick out of the country. And there has to be some sort of, of recognition of that and, and, and getting them out of the shadow so that they can pay taxes. We know who they are. We can identify them and reintegrate them into our country in some form or fashion. I mean, that's a solution. It's simple, it's, it's bipartisan, should be at least, and it's, it's, it's uh, one that most Americans agree with. But you know, if, we, if we don't start, start there, um, we're never gonna fix this problem. So we got a couple of questions from the audience. Uh, the first one, uh, and they, they haven't identified themselves in the question, but I'll read you the question. What role does China play in all of this? Should Washington be worried about their increasing investment in the hemisphere and the activity in the hemisphere? I, I believe so. Uh, I think China has been very aggressive. I think they've been, um, you know, they've been advancing while we've been retreating. I think that's one of the biggest concerns that we have. Um, they're all over South America. They're all over Central America. And anywhere where we take a step back, they take a step forward. And it's, it's, it's very intelligent on their part. Um, and I think not only that, um, I, I know that they're using uh, our actions or lack of action as a means of controlling their own hemisphere. Um, uh, more vigorously. So they are, they are doing the exact opposite we're doing. We're losing control of our hemisphere um, and we're receding in, the, in other hemispheres and they're ad advancing in their own hemisphere and advancing in ours. So I, I think, again, this is where, again, some of these discussions of, of military intervention, of whether we do things or not do things, you know, we, we see them in the context of one country, but there's a larger geopolitical realities that you have to face. And one of them is, Sometimes when you do nothing, you invite conflict, you invite military conflict. And so that's, it's, it's, it's almost like you got to pick when you're going to have to, you know, fight the fight. And we all remember uh, tragically what happened uh, before World War II when, you know, when the United Kingdom was, was saying, oh no, that, that Hitler guy, you know, he's, 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 he's increasing his armaments, but, you know, it, it's fine. He's, I've looked into his eyes, you know, he's not, uh, you know, he's not going to be a threat to the world. Uh, you know, and you see this happening, it's all happening in front of you, you know, and you're doing nothing about it. Uh, and then, and then when you have to do something about it, you're in a bad position. Uh, and, and so I think that's kind of where we, what we're sort of seeing transpire, uh, at the beginning stages. And, uh, we have, we have options, but the question is whether we exercise them and exercise leadership. Another question from the audience. In Nicaragua, President Daniel Ortega has been accused of, has been cracking down on critics and political opponents ahead of the November elections. How should the U.S. 
uh, respond to what's happening in Nicaragua? You know, again, uh, I think we have uh, three buckets of tools and it doesn't seem like we're using those buckets very effectively. Um, you know, it, it's, it's a, a bit, uh, I mean, I'm proud that the president of Uruguay said what he said, but it's shameful that the person who in the last week has been the most vocal and the most clear uh, in terms of uh, what these regimes are doing is the president of Uruguay, you know, which is a country in South America and not our own president, not our own country. And so I think at the very minimum, we have to elevate these issues in terms of the discourse. Uh, and then I think we have to use the other tools of diplomacy and pressure um, that we have at our disposal. Uh, another question from the audience. Uh, it's been two years since the United States ceased to recognize Nicolas Maduro as the legitimate president of Venezuela. However, as we speak, Maduro is still firmly entrenched in power. What does that say about U.S. influence, both as a country and as well as in the region? Yeah, and, and what does it say about the ability for, um, you know, a country, even when you saw protests in the case of Venezuela that were even greater in number than the ones on July 11th in Cuba, right? And, and they were massive. What does it say about a population's ability to recapture and retake its, its own country back, right? And that's my biggest fear. We're really not talking about it. I, I know that, again, talking about any sort of military intervention is very controversial. Um, the polls show that it's not popular. Um, as well, I would expect them to show that. But but what is the alternative, right? What is the alternative? Is the alternative to just uh, do the things that we've done and hope for the best uh, and hope that the Venezuelan people figure it out? Um, that's that's the part that I struggle with personally on a day to day basis. And uh, you know, I, I don't know that there's an answer at this particular moment. But I think the answer would be leadership, and I don't know that we have that either. Can you, another question from the audience, can you speak to how COVID-19 has played into democratic backsliding in Latin America? Well, I mean, as you can see, the COVID-19 uh, pandemic uh, has ravished uh, Latin America, and we probably don't know the extent of it, is the truth, because a lot of these governments uh, don't want to tell us what the extent of it is. And certainly, I think there may have been an opportunity, uh, had we been a little more aggressive in Cuba, to deliver some sort of humanitarian aid at the very minimum, some non-military intervention. Um, and it doesn't seem like we took advantage of that. Uh, so uh, at least in ways that could have helped us on, on point A, which is diplomacy, which is to say, hey, we have the USS Comfort parked outside you know, of, of navigable waters uh, in, in Cuba and in international waters. We're ready, will, willing, and able to administer shots, uh, you know, do whatever we can. And the Cuban government uh, is not allowing it to happen. So, I, you know, I think we've lost some opportunities there. And, 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 and again, it's been through lack of aggression. Well, the pandemic also has devastated Cuba economically. I mean, because they're, they're one of their principal sources of currency is, is tourism. tourism and, yeah. and tourism has been absolutely shut down. So is that an opportunity as well uh, for the United States in some way to squeeze the regime? There's no doubt. But I mean, if you look at uh, Miami, which is a very, very uh, intense tourist driven economy, uh, we didn't we did not fare uh, anywhere near as bad, in part because we also realized that we had to diversify. Right. And so I spent the better part of this year focusing on growing our tech economy and our finance uh, economy. And we created 8000 jobs with an average salary of 120,000. Uh, we brought in the last 16 months. $800 billion of assets under management. Uh, we closed just in the last five weeks, $475 million of venture capital deals, which is about a $6 billion pipeline. And that's a 200% increase pre-pandemic. So we have focused on uh, changing our economy so that we're not so dependent on, on one thing that frankly, oftentimes uh, are lower paying jobs. So, you know, I think it's important that cities and, 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 and cities in a, in a democratic capitalistic model they understand competition. They understand that you have to be resilient to survive. And so that's something that Cuba is in, incapable of doing. You, you mentioned in your, in your speech these medical missions uh, that the Cuban regime does around the world. And you, know, the, you, you noted that the protests weren't about COVID per se and the COVID response. Yeah. But Cubans were very angry about the fact that just as the pandemic was ravaging their country, uh, instead of having the you know Cuban doctors are supposed to be the the best doctors in the in the hemisphere, uh, instead of treating their own people, they were sending them out uh, to other countries to treat other people with COVID uh, for uh, as a source of hard currency. How is uh, you know how can we uh, how is that an opportunity for us to uh, 
to pressure the regime, the, 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 the popular anger at that uh, those medical missions. Well, you, you know, it's interesting that one of the things that the uh, sort of social media in today's day and age has debunked is that myth that the Cuban medical system is, is anything but uh, as third world as the, the rest of the country is and its aging infrastructure. Uh, the idea that it has the best doctors is just laughable. Um, and that, uh, I mean, you see the images and they're gut wrenching and they're very sad of people, um, you know, bleeding out and dying in, in, I can't even call these things hospitals. They look like houses that are converted into, to have very, very scant medical equipment. They're certainly not uh, sterilized. I mean, it's, 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 it's really, really sad, uh, to see and to think that the government is doing that. Um, uh, you know, I, I, I don't think that we have to do much more at this point in terms of. Uh, 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 of popular, uh, you know, it's this is not. I was telling somebody the other day, this is there's no longer a campaign, right? The campaign has been lost, right? Someone was was telling me, oh, you know, you have to be careful what you say because the Cuban government is going to take what you said and they're going to use it. And I, I said, thought to myself, use it for what? You know what I mean? I mean, this is not a campaign. This is this is, this is not going to bump them up three points. You know what I mean? The, the 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 people have the reason why they 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 did what they did on July 11th. You know, there's a fundamental misunderstanding of what it meant. They all spontaneously and simultaneously, without any coherent leadership, went out and protested, right? That means that they all risked their lives. That means that they all realized that this is a big lie and a big fraud and a big scam. There, this is no longer a competition of ideas between the United States and Cuba vis-a-vis -vis the Cuban people. This is not even about the United States for the Cuban people. This is about the Cuban government's inability to provide a future for the Cuban people or present, frankly. And so they're done, they've had it. And so the question is just, how do they go from that, that state that they're in to a state where they can change that? And that is the real question um, that I don't think we have a clear answer on. And, and frankly, um, I don't even think we're doing everything that we can as a country to, 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 to sort of um, make happen. So last two questions. Uh, first, the Republican party is increasingly, I don't want to say isolationist and nativist because I think that's too extreme, but I think that the Republican Party has certainly moved in the direction of less intervention and and because of the concerns about illegal immigration, which I think are legitimate, uh, there's there seems to be less openness to immigration uh, on the Republican Party. What's, what is your message to the party? Because you seem to be preaching very much the opposite of that. What is your message for the Republican Party and how, how, the, how uh, the party becomes uh, the party of Reagan again? You know, my, my message to the party is that isolationism only works for a very short period of time because there's a massive world around us. And I, I was actually hearing a Republican congressman uh, who I think is generally pretty far right in, in terms of his pronouncement, Dan Crenshaw from Texas. And he was saying, you know, in Afghanistan, there wasn't, there hadn't been a casualty for 18 months uh, prior to the withdrawal. And it really wasn't a war in the classic sense. It was really more similar to our presence that we have in a variety of theaters throughout the world. And, and those presence are strategic, they're necessary. Um, they, they, they create a forward facing uh, uh, potential battlefront. Um, so, you know, it, it's not that, again, we want to be the world's policeman or, or anything like that, but there are strategic reasons why we are in different places or, around the world and we have resources there and it's part of protecting ourselves, right? So again, th th it's a mu fundamental misunderstanding. If we can just, if we just recede into ourselves, uh, everything was, is going to be fine. You know, the world will leave us alone. We'll leave the world alone. We'll focus on our own economy and everything's going to be great. And unfortunately, what we've seen in the history of the world and in our history and the history of this planet is that that has not quite played out that way. And while we start receding, other countries, our enemies, frankly, um, will continue to advance to a point where one day we're going to wake up and say, oh, my God, we're overwhelmed. Um, we're completely surrounded. And then you can't you can't put the genie back in the bottle. And then my exit question is, what's next for you? Uh, so uh, in the 2020 election, uh, Democrats had Mayor Pete, uh, who was one of the top tier candidates for the, for the presidency. Uh, in 2024, will Republicans have Mayor Francis uh, in, in that tier? And, and how does the mayoralty uh, prepare you for the presidency? Well, Mayor Pete is a friend, and I think he did a great job. And I think, uh, you know, he definitely made it possible for a young mayor uh, to run a credible presidential campaign. Uh, I, I think being mayor uh, helps in a variety of ways. First, 
you're a problem solver as opposed to someone who is acting purely in a partisan fashion. You know, as you said at the beginning, I was blessed to be elected by 86% of my residents. That means you have to be a consensus builder. You have to focus on problems uh, and, and solutions. I think, I don't know, being mayor, uh, uh, you know, so much as being mayor of Miami, you know, because <laughs> you do you do have this sort of foreign policy role, right, which is very different from a mayor of a middle American city uh, that may not be talking about foreign affairs in the way that the mayor of Miami is asked to discuss some of these matters. So you do have you get a, a, a feel for foreign affairs and how uh, the United States fits in the equation of the world. And then obviously you're a chief executive as, 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 as any executive would be. You know, from my perspective, um, I'm, I'm hoping to be reelected now in November. Uh, everything looks good. The qualifying period just ended in Saturday, on Saturday and there was no uh, major surprises in terms of major opponents yet. Um, and then I become president of the U.S. Conference of Mayors in January. That's a one and a half year term. So I get to set an agenda for urban America. Uh, that I'm very passionate about an agenda with low taxes uh, instead of reducing, you know, instead of uh, decreasing uh, our police uh, funding, increasing funding for police uh, and making our city safer and focusing on quality of life issues like reducing crime and homelessness, uh, which I think is a formula for urban America. If all that plays out in the next year and a half, I mean, who knows uh, what can happen? Uh, but um, right now I'm focusing on that uh, completely and, and we'll see what, 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 what the big guy upstairs has in mind for me. Are you thinking of running though? I don't think there's a person on this planet that wouldn't like to be president of the United States. <laughs> I, I think, I think you have to, you have to, uh, one of the things I've learned being around politics since basically I was two years old is that a lot of it is circumstantial and driven by circumstances, right place, right time kind of a situation. I do think that the country is thirsting for a new generation of leadership. I really do believe that. And I said that recently in, in an article on the Hill that was published that, you know, it's time to move on. Right. And I was blessed uh, as mayor, to make that transition from the prior generation to my generation. And you're seeing a generation worth of improvement in our processes and innovation. And that's what's going to keep Miami competitive. Uh, I think we have to make that similar leap as a country. Well, I'm sure your, your, your father, the former mayor, is incredibly proud to see his son uh, sitting in the same office that he once occupied. And uh, I think he, he probably agrees that you're, the sky's the limit for you. So thank you so much for thank joining you. us here in AI and, and sharing your thoughts. And we hope to have you back soon. Wonderful opportunity. Thanks again. I'm sorry I couldn't be in person. All right. Take care. Thank you.